Royal Double University welcome you to the webinar organized by Royal School of Nursing. Today's topic is on emerging palliative care issues. But before going deep into the topic, I would like to highlight a bit about the university. Royal Global University was established in 2017, and in just three years span, we were present. We are presently ranked the number one university in Assam. We maintain consistency, as you can see now, by organizing webinars, taking online classes daily, and contact, conducting exams online, and the list goes on. We take and accept challenges and seek opportunities and make impossible possible. So we have a strong pillar, a great supporter, a motivator, and a leader who made us, who made all this possible, who is none other than our Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. S.P. Singh, sir. Uh, uh, before we go uh, deeper, uh, I'd just like to give a highlight about our today's topic. Care of the dying is not new, and different cultures have different approaches to helping people at the end of their lives. Palliative care is based on a model developed in response to the need of, needs of patients in hospice movement. The aim of palliative care is to provide the best quality uh, of life both for the people approaching the end of life and their families and careers. It is a holistic approach to care and support and take into account emotional, psychological, and spiritual needs as well as physical needs. There are certain issues like physical needs, emotional needs, practical concern, and other broad range of issues. Uh, so before I uh, introduce the speakers for today, I would like uh, is uh, VC sir present here with us? Is VC sir present here with us? I think uh, sir has got uh, some other important works. I hope he will be attending after some few uh, minutes. Before that, I would like to request Dr. Gudumani Kaur, Dean, Royal School of Nursing and Allied and Health Sciences, uh, to have an introductory note. Ma'am, over to you. Thank you, Dorothy. So, good afternoon, everybody. Today, we have gathered here to learn about palliative care and its issues. So, once we come to know, once we utter the word palliative care, what does it mean? It is the care of the people who will terminally ill. It is the concept of everybody that when we say the palliative care, it is only for the people who is having cancer. But it is not only for the cancer. Palliative care is for end of life care for all the chronic diseases like uh, like COPD, lung diseases, cardiac diseases, then any other chronic illnesses, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinsonia's disease. Although all those diseases, chronic illness, at the end of their life, they need palliative care. So what is the meaning of palliative care? It is response to the suffering. So palliative care is the response to the suffering. So what are the things we are doing during the palliative care? We are providing support to the patient. We are providing psychological support to the patient. We are providing spiritual support to the patient, cultural and social support to the patient, as well as to their family. And it is mainly elevation of suffering to the people. So the elevation of sufferings, mainly the symptom management, what the palliative care does, that is pain management, nausea and vomiting management. There may be management of anxiety, depression, then it may be constipation or difficulty in breathing or any other symptoms like fatigue, trouble sleeping, then person may be having a big wound, dressing of that wound, those things were of the palliative, importance of the palliative care. So if we see 
So there is very important aspect, the integration of psychology and spirituality in the care of the patient. As the person is about to die or his life is going to be end, or what we are trying to do to elevate his suffering, make his life comfortable and make him easy for easy dying. So we are preparing the person to live the life, not waiting for the death. So we are making the person as much as possible to the fullest extent to live the life. They should be as much as active till the end of their life. And all the family members also, we are preparing them to, for their bereavement of the persons what he is suffering or about the loss of the near and dear ones. And that the, if suppose someone is having a big wound on his, on his or her face, then the taking care of that wound is very important. Otherwise, that wound will be very offensive. And if I look, the look of that wound itself will be very difficult for the family members. So the taking care of the person of that wound, the person will be able to take part in the family as well as that family members will be cooperating with the person. So that is the concept of palliative care. If we see in India, for, uh, in, in world, according to the World Health Organization, 14 million people need every year palliative care. But from that, only seven, from that, 78 percentage of them were from low and middle income countries. But from this 40 million people, only 14 percent of the people only live only received the palliative care. That is the huge demand of the palliative care. If we see in India, the state, mainly Kerala, is able to overcome that target. So it, the Kerala has made the model of palliative care, which is the best model they were telling in India. So hope in the near future in the other states also will be coming. And more details will be highlighted by our guest speakers as we have invited two persons one is dr lata srikant who is taking care of the palliative patients since from long time and we are have called dr santana das who is also taking care with the palliative care so hope we'll get a very good highlight from both the eminent speakers so integration of palliative care is the main issue to it inculcate it to the mainstream of healthcare. With this introductory piece, I'd leave the mic to Dorothy. Dorothy, over to you. Okay, thank you so much, ma'am, for the introductory remark. Uh, before we go again deeper into the topic, I would just like to tell to the participants that uh, there will be a link provided at the end of the meeting that is the feedback link for those people so for those participants who give the feedback form, they will be getting the e-certificate, not only the registration. Uh, for getting the e-certificate, it is a must to join till the end of the meeting and get the uh, link for the feedback. And I would like to request the participants to please mute your audio and then put off your video so that the functioning of the uh, webinar is smooth enough. Uh, to have more insight into the topic, we have a very relevant speaker or relevant speakers, an expert in palliative care amidst us. Uh, I would like to request our eminent speaker for this evening, Dr. I'd like to introduce Dr. Shantana Das and Dr. Latha Srikant. Uh, before I call upon them to give their uh, speech, uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Shantana Das. Uh, Dr. Shantana Das is a medical officer, Department of Pain and Palliative Care, State Cancer Institute, GMCH, Gohati, Assam. Ma'am has completed her MBBS at RGUHS, that is Rajiv Gandhi University of Health and Sciences, FID course from uh, Apollo, Chennai, and Palliative Medicine from Tata Memorial, Mumbai. Ma'am is a life member of IAPC, a faculty in IAPC course of doctors and nurses, SCI and CI. Sir, Dr. Shantana Das is also a faculty in training course in palliative care, SCI GMCH, and is 
a member of organizing committee IAPCO and 2020. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Shantana Das and I would like to hand over the time to her. Ma'am, are you there, ma'am? Thank you so much, Dorothy, for the introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, all. Um, so I think I'll be starting the webinar today with my topic. Um, uh, am I audible to all? Am I audible? Yes, yes. ma'am. Okay. So um, I'll be sharing my screen. Um, I've made a small presentation, so yeah. Is it visible? Is my presentation visible? Yes. Yes, ma'am, it is visible. It's visible, right? Yeah. So I presume um, palliative care is going to be very new for some of you. This uh, topic is going to be new for uh, some of the audience here. So I will uh, mostly focus on uh, giving a brief introduction to palliative care. Also, um, I would like to address some of the nursing issues in palliative care. And towards the end, I'll go to end of life care. It will be a very short one. I'll be speaking very briefly. We'll not go much into details. Um, there, is, there is a huge uh, need for continuous care for those for those who are suffering from long-term diseases, like ma'am said just now, uh, long-term diseases or progressive diseases, um, mostly I, I have been dealing with cancer patients. So I look after the palliative care department uh, in cancer hospital, State Cancer Institute. Uh, since last three years after my training, I have been looking uh, into, uh, into the patients uh, with utmost care and we are a huge team. So we are three doctors, we have few nurses, social worker, counselors, and volunteers as well. We have trained a lot of volunteers in the state, uh, which through, through them, we are connected to a lot of our patients. They have been a big helping hand with us, you know, when running this department smoothly. So, um, yes, so this kind of progressive diseases or incurable diseases are unmet, you know, the, uh, the need for continuous care is unmet with the present, with the current healthcare delivery system. If we divide diseases into three types, uh, the first would be something which we can, you know, diseases where we can achieve a definite cure and uh, diseases where which, which can be controlled only up to an extent and diseases which would progress despite uh, despite uh, putting best medical inputs. Those are the diseases where we will need palliative care towards the end of life, you know. So what does palliative care, palliative mean? Palliate word comes from the Latin word pallium. Pallium is something, palliate defines, pallium defines cloak. Cloak is something which covers, you know, the overall protection given to a patient right from the beginning of the disease till the end of his life. And um, throughout the journey, we look after the patient, not only uh, to uh, make the patient symptom free or pain free, also to um, also looking up to, uh, looking up to his uh, social uh, issues or psychological issues, spiritual issues. So these are very important things that we should keep in mind. Uh, Care of the sick has been constant concern for human, you know, human being, human society throughout history. In Indian tradition, we have ancient history of caring for old, caring for ailing, and caring for dying. In uh, 273 to 232 BC, King Ashoka built uh, 18 institutions in India, which were very, very similar to the modern hospice which we have now. And we are trying to um, we are trying to build uh, hospices as many hospices as possible just to provide the end of life care to our patients. Yeah. Um, so this is the WHO meaning given to palliative care. It is an approach that improves the quality of life of patients and their families facing the problem associated with the life-threatening illnesses, life-threatening illnesses as in 
those illnesses like just now ma'am um, uh, mentioned uh, those who are going to be bedridden for a long time the chronic illnesses neurological diseases cancer hiv <coughs> pediatric cases cerebral palsy through the prevention and relief of suffering by means of early identification and impeccable assessment and treatment of pain and other problems like physical social psychoso uh, psychosocial and spiritual we have set up few goals for palliative care when we see a patient suffering from a chronic illness we first think that how do we make the patient comfortable you know because that disease is going to stay with the patient for a long time and we know that we have to relieve the patient from a lot of symptoms not just not just physical pain you know uh, we have to uh, provide the patient uh, uh, psychological support spiritual support then we have to offer a support system to the family because uh, a caregiver also suffers equally with the patient and um, we should come life and regard dying as a normal process because end of life care we in towards the end of life care i'll talk about it and uh, we as uh, healthcare professionals we neither try to uh, hasten death or postpone death uh, it is going to be a normal process which we have to be there throughout you know? offer a support system to help patients live actively as possible until death so when we see this picture uh, is it visible to everyone is it clear when we yes, see this picture uh, this this is a he's a patient you know he's a cancer patient and he is uh, in his dying bed he is in his death bed he is probably having a lot of uh, pain where which we can see uh, he has a nasogastric tube intubated there's a tube and he is feeding through this tube there's a big mass over here on his neck there's a growth which uh, probably is pressing upon his a uh, food pipe air pipe and he's having difficulty in eating food probably having feeding uh, breathing difficulty as well the patient looks very malnourished he could be having bed sores because he's bedridden mostly and looks like uh, he's paralyzed as well um if you can see the half half of his face one side of his face is swollen and pain is very poorly controlled he's uh, not able to, he's non ambulatory so if we see if you look at so many problems in one patient and we need to do we need to cover up all his symptoms you know we need to make him symptom free pain free what do we do how do we go about it how do we start we need to have a teamwork for this you know a teamwork where someone can control his pain nurses can uh, doctors can go and treat the patient volunteers can connect the patient Uh, with the treating um, team you know wherever the hospital or the hospice is and uh, a social worker can always be in touch with the patient if the patient needs anything so these are the things how the whole team is going to work so this is a these are some few facts 15 58 million people die in the world every year 35 million of these people will die of chronic life limiting illnesses family and caregivers need help and assistance in caring 100 million people in need of care majority of patients die in institutions people would want to die in home but um, they end up dying in institutions because they don't know because they are not aware they they fear the death they they fear the unknown they don't know how is how is their death going to be so they prefer dying in institutions but if you actually talk to patients if you find out if you have a good communication with your patient then your patient will definitely opt dying at home peacefully yes yes, yes. uh common symptoms in palliative care mostly we will see all this pain depression insomnia breathlessness anorexia constipation vomiting um uh, nausea these are the usually these are the very common problems with um, patients you know palliative care patients the life uh, limiting illnesses uh coming to evolution of the concept how how was this palliative care uh, started where was the hospice started who started it uh 
uh, Dam Cicely Mary Stott Saunders. She was an English nurse. She was a social worker. She was a physician and a writer. She is noted for her work in terminal care research that led to her role in the uh, birth of the hospice movement. In 1967, St. Christopher's Hospice, the world's first purpose built hospice was established. The hospice was founded on the principles of combining teaching, clinical research of um, uh, and um, principles of combining teaching, clinical research, pain and other symptoms relief with holistic care, not just uh, treatment, treating the patient with holistic care to meet the physical, social, psychological, spiritual needs of the patient and those of the family, of their family and friends who are suffering with the patient, the first caregivers. You know, it uh, it is an approach to meet the demands of the whole uh, patient and their family who are, and the caregivers who are with the patient uh, going through the same journey. So Cicely Saunders in 1967 founded the St. Christopher's Hospice in London. It was the first modern hospice and uh, she was a nurse and a physician. Coming to the issues that are faced by uh, the challenges, I would say, by palliative care professionals, some of uh, not just the uh, palliative care professionals, patients and family as well. Social issues, psychological, spiritual. If we see social issues, there are family collusions at times. What are the family? What, what is actually family collusion? Usually occurs when the family conspires among themselves to uh, or with professionals to lie to the patient, to lie to the patient or to hold uh, or withhold some important information uh, from the patient. Like suppose uh, the when we um, break the bad news to the patient's family, the family does not uh, want the patient to know about it. And they ask us that doctor or nurse, please do not talk to my patient about it. I do not want my patient to know that he or she has cancer or he or she is going to die soon or he or she is um, going to just receive treatment or not receive treatment is incurable or whatever be it. So that, that comes, that is family collusion. So it's it's an it's a social issue that needs to be addressed. Conclusion collusion must be addressed when it is hindering uh, good uh, quality care, when it is leading to some futile interventions, and it when it is doing harm to the patient. It should be addressed. Uh, good clinical communication will help us a lot. In um, through good communication, the patient will express his needs to the treating team more effectively. It helps clarify doubts and uh, uh, baseless apprehensions. So the patient will be clear in his or her head what is going to be done to the patient after the diagnosis. So the uh, family collusion is one, not willing to break the bad news to the patient. Then uh, the patient sometimes will have social issues like financial crisis, children's education, future plans, um, where where can the patient go for terminal care? How is his death going to be? Uh, what is what is cancer? Is cancer contagious? Is his family going to suffer after him? So these are some of the social issues. Also social stigma, which uh, mostly uh, places in in villages. In, in fact, in some cities, towns as well. Some people think that it is contagious, you know, that family is suffering from cancer. We should not, uh, we should abandon them. So this kind of social stigma is still prevalent in our country. Um, psychological distress is something to do with um, uh, psychological uh, issues like, why did this happen to me? Why am I suffering? I have been a kind person. I, I have never smoked. I have never uh, drank. So why why this happened just only to me so will how will my last days be will it be very painful so some people even commit suicide you know because of this kind of distress that happens to them during the course of the disease 
um, spiritual distress is again another issue. Um, they again think that this may be because of karma. I have done something bad in my previous life and uh, all this is happening to me. This will happen to my family. This is going to haunt me forever. So this kind of spiritual issues also sometimes come up. Um, so basically uh, making the patient symptom free, providing some kind of psychological support by counselors, by psychologists. Uh, is very important. It is. It has to be a teamwork, a social worker, a volunteer, a, a counselor, doctors, nurses. Everybody have to work as a team and uh, uh, combat this uh, these issues, social issues, psychological issues, spiritual issues. Mm, teamwork. The team is defined as a group of individuals with a common purpose of working together. The patient and his or her family is the central member of the team. We should always uh, make the patient our main uh, member, central member, and we should work around the central member to make the patient feel comfortable and um, make his uh, you know, journey very smooth and pain-free. What are the good symptom control? Good symptom control is evaluation, explanation, management, monitoring, and attention to detail. So if you go back to this picture, uh, evaluation. When we see this patient, we evaluate that probably the growth in his neck is in his neck is um, uh, compressing upon compressing upon his uh, esophagus or um, air pipe. You know, so we have to evaluate if he's able to breathe properly, if he's able to eat properly. Uh, if not, if he's not able to eat properly, if he, um, if he's on liquid diet or semi-solid, we should encourage him to somehow uh, put a nasogastric tube so that his feeding is um, achieved. You know, we can put some, we can push food through the uh, feeding pipe through this nasogastric tube, which is there. And while evaluating, uh, we also find out a lot other things, which is uh, there in the body, like bed sores. And then we explain to the patient. Explanation is the next term, you know, evaluation and then explanation. We explain to the patient that so and so has happened to you and we are going to put a nasogastric tube if you are comfortable with it. And this will feed, this will help you in feeding. And um, after explaining the procedure, if the patient is okay with it, we go and we manage the um, individual uh, symptoms. Then we monitor, we just not provide treatment and we ju just not uh, let the patient stay like that. We monitor, we see that the food is going through the pipe. Uh, we try and give them a, a nutritionist, a consult, um, good consultation with the nutrition nutritionist so that, you know, proper food at proper time goes into the patient's uh, body. And uh, we monitor, suppose there is an emergency tracheostomy that has to be done. We have to monitor if the tracheostomy is in situ, is in place, and if proper suctioning is done, proper care Sorry, is taken. Hello? Hello? Yeah. So these are, these are, is there anything? Ma'am, continue. Yeah. So these are, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, these are, these are the attention that we need to pay. Uh, some minute details, you know, then non-drug methods. Drug, drug methods is something which we provide to the patient like pain relief and, you know, providing all this symptom, uh, symptomatic care is given. Non-drug methods are divergent therapies, guided imagery, relax, relaxation, massage, art therapy, music, acupuncture, acupressure. So we have in, in our hospital, we have this beautiful art therapy and music therapy, which goes on every uh, week once in a week for the patients, for the caregivers, along with the family members, whoever wants to come and join the therapy, they can. And in our therapy, what we do is we let the patient, uh, we provide them with every material and we ask them to draw whatever is there in their mind, whatever is there in their heart. And they, they draw such beautiful pictures. We keep them with us, you know, it's, 
it's like something they they draw something which they imagine you know they sometimes come up with nice family picture they draw the family and we ask them why did you draw your family then they say that this is the most thing i missed i missed during my um, treatment i'm not able to go home since so many days so many months and i miss uh, my family so much that they end up they draw beautiful house huts and families and beautiful sceneries so these are the kind of art therapy that we ask them to do so this this also relieves pain you know to a, to a great extent then music therapy um we all uh, the whole palliative care team um we sit with the patient and we listen to some nice music and we do some meditation then um uh, it's it's very relaxing it's very nice this kind of therapies i think non drug methods are very useful in uh, treating most of the pain it, it is not just physical pain so it helps you know and this is meditation which was in tmh tata memorial these are med meditation classes how it happens there <clears throat> basic principles for medical medical ethics respect for uh, not, uh, so basically we health professionals we do a lot for them but we also have to look after some ethics we have to follow some ethics like respect for autonomy self which is self determination beneficence which is to do good non maleficence which is not to harm and justice is to be fair to give a fair treatment to each patient equally psychological support so psychological support is something it is uh, psychological uh, issues like anxiety fear apprehension depression loss of uh, dignity loneliness then uh, guilt a sense of being a burden on others these are the issues that needs to be supported because in the end um, uh, if if we don't talk to patients if you don't find out what is what is causing so much of pain in their uh, head because of these issues then uh, i think the pa the patient won't be uh, comfortable during his journey so we uh, apply some advanced directives we do some networking with the volunteers we talk to volunteers who are in the vicinity of the patients you know lo locality and they go they usually every weekly or monthly they visit once the volunteers and they try to talk to the family that if there's anything that needs to be addressed can we should we speak to the doctor should we call a nurse is there any problem with the family because sometimes you know the husband the wife if when they suffer um, they leave each other and um, the wife has to come usually i have seen many patients they come to our opd alone and they are like my husband left me because i am suffering from cancer and uh, he is going to marry some uh, different woman now so these are the problems issues mostly are faced by healthcare professionals uh, with patients so we do a very active networking we try to find out if any patient needs any support we try to bring them to our hospital talk to them also we bring the family we talk to them and if nothing works then we put the patient in hospice care and uh, we look after the patient till until the patient uh, dies and we also provide bereavement support bereavement support is given to mostly to pediat in pediatric cases because when a child dies the parents are so devastated that until you go and support give them bereavement support it's very difficult for them to come back to normalcy very difficult to start their life again so bereavement support is much required as psychological support communication mm. so um good communication between health workers and patient makes the patient um, makes the patient feel comfortable they know that someone cares and they are not alone in their journey and um, patient would have clarity about their treatment plan and might feel more in control of their life uh, so communication a good communication is must it will reduce uncertainty a lot of questions in their mind will be uh you know spoken about um they it will enhance relationship between the treating team and the patient it will give the patient and the family a direction uh, to move because most of the time they are clueless what to do what, what is going to be done next uh, if the treatment is not if it is not curable why is the doctor still calling us so this kind of questions will be 
uh, solved you know a good communication is must so that's why we always make sure whenever a patient comes talk to them talk to the family talk to the patient keep talking they may not open up once they may not open up in the second uh, meeting but they will definitely do it later, sooner or later um social and spiritual support so social support like i told you the volunteers go and talk to them and if there's any financial crisis if any help is required if any um, community based awareness is required because sometimes you know the whole community is against the uh, family who are uh, living with the cancer patient then making nursing care and medical care available uh, also caring for the caregivers all these are social support and spiritual would be spiritual pain is something when a person suffering gets disturbed like i told you a lot of questions arise in their mind like i did not drink i did not smoke i was a good kind person throughout my life why did this happen to me or am i i am of no use to anyone my life what is the point of me being alive so this kind of questions do come and spirituality providing spiritual support is that special dimension in human beings that gives a meaning or purpose to life uh, making them talk to some spiritual healer or a spiritual leader which will give them some motivation you know and it includes searching and finding the meaning of life and meaning of death a person may be spiritual without being religious so we can always consider this as one of spiritual support as one of the main entities you know this will help pay, uh, motivate the patient a lot it will bring back normalcy in the patient's life because usually patients suffer from a lot of depression once the chronic illness hits in uh, spiritual support we train volunteers also and we should provide them some kind of privacy to you know support them from the distress that they are going through where where can we provide palliative care we can provide palliative care in the hospital at home in the hospice if a patient goes to hospital he can always come back to home and then again go back to hospital so it's a fluid state you know a patient staying in hospice can always go back home and also patient can go back to hospital so there is no um, uh, specified a journey that after the hospital course is completed you have to stay at home no you can patient can always come back patient can always come back for uh, day care for palliative day care and then we can send them back home or we can send back to a hospice if the patient wants to stay so this is a you know cycle not specific so this is a hospital setup where family visits you know, we can see family visits this is Narendra Modi. This is one, one of the volunteers. So here we can see one patient lying, a pediatric you know, child. She's lying very comfortably with her mother in the ward. So this is home visits. These are the home care team, which goes and sees the patient at home. If they need anything, medicines, like providing with painkillers, providing with wound management, Changing of nasogastric tube, tracheostomy care, pet, uh, back care, everything is looked upon. This is a hospice. This is called Shanti Avedana. It's in Tata, it's in uh, Bandra, Mumbai, very close to Shah Rukh Khan's house, and uh, very beautiful view. And there are so many uh, nice patients, you know, they have lived in the hospice for so long and they stay there they continue they like to would, when i spoke to them they said they would like to continue to stay there in the hospice so hospice is a very friendly place it's not just place for the dying bereavement support bereavement support is again um, so what is bereavement when a person dies we say that their family is bereaved and this means they lost someone precious and close to them and are grieving support given to the family to go through this period and get back to regular productive life is called bereavement support so there are stages of grief initial shock 
there could be pangs of grief, there could be uh, despair, there could be adjustment problem. And that's why we need to provide them bereavement support so that they accept the reality. They, uh, we, we as health professionals experience the same pain with them because we have this, we have been through the journey with them. Then we help them adjust with the environment and we help them develop interest and get back to normal life as soon as possible. Because otherwise the patient will, the patient's family will go into depression. So we are there from the beginning till the bereavement support. Everything has to be looked after. Like a cloak, like I said, you know, it encompasses everything. Tough stress, I will talk about it later. So yeah, this, these are the few things that we have seen in palliative care. It's a very short one. Then coming to nursing uh, issues, nursing, nursing measures for patients' comfort. Uh, we look after patient, patient care. What is the aim of patient care? And how can we make them comfortable? What are the patient comfortable uh, comfort measures? First of all, we uh, uh, provide them total holistic care. You know, we meet the physical demands. We look after psychological, social, spiritual needs, like I just explained. The aim of providing patient care would be to provide comfort, to make their journey uh, smooth, to relieve them of pain, to improve their quality of life, and so that they can get back to at least 50% of their normal life. And patient comfort measures are here, like uh, in case of a bedridden patient, use we can use uh, air cushions, mattress, then look after back, frequent back care, uh, use of good massages or healing touch. Then uh, for a tracheostomy patient, frequent suctioning, care of the skin around the tracheostomy to relieve pain. Then uh, in case of a patient with a tube, nasogastric tube, uh, when the patient is not um, taking any food from the mouth, we encourage them to take some little liquid from the mouth and we uh, encourage them to do frequent uh, mouthwash to maintain some hygiene, then uh, add roughage to their diet and um, to avoid constipation, lubrication of lips. So these are the few things that uh, nursing, yeah, nursing care for making the patient comfortable at home, at hospital or anywhere. End of life care. End of life care is another entity which is very important because right now when we see uh, chronic illnesses, they mostly need end of life care. And these are just few facts here. 21 million patients die worldwide, which require palliative care and the end of life. 377 patients out of 1 lakh and 6 patients out of 1 lakh need palliative care at the end of life. 78% of adults and 98% of children need palliative care at the end of life, which belong who belong to low and middle income in uh, countries. 38.5% of cardiovascular diseases require end of life care. 34% cancer diseases require end of life care. Chronic liver diseases 10.3% and HIV stands 5.7% in needing end of life care. So this is where we stand. A good death, a good. Uh, so, in, in the score from one to five, India scores second in public awareness of end of life care. So, we are very, uh, very much, we need very much uh, public awareness for end of life care because this is, uh, this is where the patient suffers, you know, towards the end of life. Um, Coming to yeah, so good death, good death is one that is free from avoidable, avoidable distress and suffering. As um, healthcare professionals working in palliative care, we are more aware of the concept of a good death than most of than most of other um, uh, healthcare providers. So we we as healthcare providers in palliative care must consider three things. One is recognizing that, uh, assessing the patient needs and practical aspects. So recognizing dying when the when the death is coming to understand what can be expected, to if, to be able to retain control of what happens, to be afforded dignity and privacy, 
to have control over pain relief and other symptoms control to have a choice to have choice and control over with where death occurs whether the patient wants to die in the hospital or with the family at home to have access to information and expertise of whatever kind is necessary to have wishes respected and have access to any special needs like we hear here that uh, we hear that you know when uh, one of the parents suffer from cancer or any life limiting illnesses they want their uh, child to get married because they want to see their um, doctor or son getting married before they die so this is a special wish that uh, some of us can help them in achieving so the this is one of end of life care this is one of principle of good death to have control over who is present and who shares the end to be able to leave when it is time to go and not to have life prolonged pointlessly so not to resuscitate not to put the patient in ventilator most of the patients when they come to us end of life care we explain to them very clearly we tell them that see in case any emergency comes if you wish to die at home if you wish to die peacefully then i think you should be at home and understand that death comes to all and do not rush to hospital and they understand it very well and they take it very positively and um, even even patients say you know it's pointless running around uh, hospital to hospital when you know end of life care has been taken care of so steps involving in providing good end of life care are recognizing dying process like i told you end of life decision making if somebody wants to um sign off something like somebody has um you know suppose so and so has want wants to put the power of eternity to his son or his daughter so they can make this end of life decision making uh, you know uh, ethics that they want to do so we always tell them that your end is nearing if there is any communication you want to make with your um, official uh, whatever or your family you can always make so it becomes very easy also and peaceful also for the person who is dying initiation of end of life care process process of end of life care after that care review of care process bereavement care support so it is a whole total thing that needs to be covered in end of life care uh decision making like uh, discussing the life expecting ex expectancies done in the beginning discussing future symptoms and management if suppose patient goes in the patient is in the hospital and have to be half uh, resuscitated then we always you know discuss with the patient and we document it we write it down that the dnr do not resuscitate allow the patient to have a natural death so these are some of the advanced care planning that we do with the patient by discussing with good communication so these are few end of life care things i think i'm almost done with it i've covered a end of life care nursing issues and basics of palliative care i hope did not take much time yeah is it fine any questions yes, uh ma'am uh, there will be one more speaker speaking now uh, so after okay. the end of the session, we have a question and answer round. There are so many questions that have that have already arrived. So I'll be okay. asking. Uh, I'll be coming to the questions round. Uh, okay. Uh, after the uh, other speaker uh, finishes her speech. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Shantana Das, for taking your for taking your time out from your busy schedule. So you have pointed Thank you out so much. Uh, the meaning of. Yes, you have pointed out the meaning of palliative goal. Ma'am, I have a doubt. Yes, yes. Hello? Hello, yeah. Uh, I can, uh, I'm, yeah. I have, uh, I have a doubt. Yes. Ma'am, this is just a general reminder that the question and answer round will be in the last uh, session. We still have one more speaker among us. Uh, so kindly, please, uh, participants, please do wait for some time. Um, I would uh, like to thank Dr. Shantana Das. Uh, she had pointed out a very vast, uh, she has included a very vast topic in a very short period of time. She has clapped up whatever is important. Uh, so I would just like to move on to uh, the next speaker, uh, uh, Dr. Latha uh, Srikant. She is uh, a professor in nursing, completed her UG and PG courses at CMC Valor, and she is holding a PhD degree uh, and got it from Anamalai University. Ma'am had completed certificate courses in palliative nursing. Uh, 
uh, at Pilet, uh, Palliam, India, Kerala. Ma'am has six plus 16 years of teaching and administration and research experiences and had published 16 papers and, <laughs> and also had completed one international project and had been a resource person for both the state, national, and international conferences. Dr. Srikant uh, ha also has five years of palliative care experiences. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Latha Srikant, ma'am, to take over her time. Dr. Latha Srikant, ma'am? Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hello. Yes, good afternoon, ma'am. Yes, you are able to hear me? Hello? Yes, ma'am. Am I audible yes, to you, all of you? Yes, yes, you are audible. Okay, is the slide visible to you all? Yes. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Please make it slide show. Uh, uh, nice, visible. Okay. Okay, thank you, Dorothy. And uh, Dr. Shantana Das, madam, has uh, made my uh, uh, talk very easy because she has given a theory of the entire palliative care. So I'm going to talk about the palliative care issues which is emerging in nursing. Especially I'm going to concentrate on nursing with my experience. Okay, so what uh, uh, you see in this slide is my favorite patient. Now before going to my uh, speech, I would like to thank my teachers who molded me from CMC Mellow and Dr. Uh, M.R. Rajagopal sir, chairman, Kalyan William sir, who trained me in palliative care. And I also thank Vikimoni, uh, my dear friend, for giving me the opportunity to express my experience. And uh, the management and principal, uh, Professor Mrs. Krita Lakshmi, Madam, Chief College of Mercy, for giving me the opportunity and motivating me talk about this topic. Thank you so much. So I, uh, this slide, when you see this patient, here's my favorite patient who taught me the importance of communication because he cannot hear and he cannot speak because he has a, he had a cancer in the pharynx, he can't speak. So I will be showing you later what are the communication, how we had with him. Okay, so I'm happy. I'm very proud to say that Madam already has covered, Madam uh, Dam Sisley Saunders has started her career with the nursing. Okay, since she couldn't uh, continue her uh, as a nurse because she's a tall and hefty lady with the, she had a severe back pain. So she couldn't continue as a nurse. So she went back as, and worked as a social worker. Even then she was not satisfied. And she thought that one day if she completes medicine, she can provide a holistic care to patients. So later on she did medicine and she's a very good writer. And although other things Madam has covered it, the very famous and the quote of her, which I like more is, you matter because you are you and you matter to the end of your life. So I like this quote very much. That's why I have put it here. Okay, so Madam has covered this part and this part also Madam has covered definition and all these things and why palliative care in India. Okay, Madam has covered, but a few points I would like to mention here. The life expectancy in India has increased up to 70 years in 2020. And because as the age increase, the number of morbidities also have increased. The Human Rights Watch has rightly pointed out that denial to palliative care is a violation of human rights. Okay, so these are the things Madam has already covered it. And uh, but it is very pathetic to know that even though we 5.5 million people need palliative care in India, only less than 3% of them have an access to palliative care. 
okay this we know that uh, these are the few cases which madam has already covered it okay so who are the team members the trained uh, who all can provide palliative care trained general practitioners or family doctors dentist nurse palliative care specialist or physician cancer specialist counselor or psychologist spiritual care practitioner social worker occupational therapist physiotherapist i saw one of the chat that they asked whether what is the role of physiotherapist because we are not only taking care of patients with the chronic illness we also take care of patients with the paraplegia hemiplegia or quadriplegia so their role is more important and volunteers and family workers so they are the team members okay so let me go into the topic energy palliative care issues okay now we are now facing a covid okay in this covid what you see in this picture is a iceberg okay what you see on the top is what are few cases we don't know how many cases are left under the sea so in this covid what i have experienced i would like to quote here i actually i am living in jodhpur now previously we were in pondicherry we went for an uh, vacation before lockdown and because of the lockdown we were locked down in pondicherry so during that time so many patients knows that we used to provide a palliative care every day i used to get at least one or two uh, calls for a help so i would like to quote these three cases okay, the first one is a 50 years old male uh, the relative called me that he is having a hematuria so they asked me what to do so i told them he was all right he doesn't have any problem before that so i told them to go and see the urologist immediately they said it is not possible because of this lockdown getting e pass is very difficult but somehow i told them it is very important that he has to be seen by the urologist even i got an appointment to talk to the inquiry in uh, cmc also i tried them I, i tried to get an appointment on next day but unfortunately they are they were unable to go because of the transport problem then later on we helped them to go to salem in tamil nadu he was operated he is well today okay the next one is about we got, we got a phone call from a very far place 85 years old lady fell down had a fracture and he was not taken to hospital prior of covid and also unable to go because of the transport problem and she was she was at home developed a big bed so and was uh, developed a pus also the relative last month they called me what to do so i told them what they have to do if they leave it like that patient will develop septicemia so i told them to take immediately to the hospital they said it is not possible first thing is they have to get a pus second thing they have to get they have to get uh uh sorry transport problem next they have are they unaffordable so but i told them how to prepare normal saline at home and i told them how to prepare uh, some cotton to free so by the time within one week they got a uh, e pass and then they went to the hospital and she was better now but with a big bed so and another case we got a call from within pondicherry itself i got a call and they told the relatives told me the patient is having a full bladder unable to pass urine and he was also having a nausea and having a severe pain and i can't go because it is very far from my place and i told them what they have to do and when they approached the pharmacy they were not giving the medicine you see the issues what are the issues the patients are facing and the care providers are facing so these are the issues and uh, then i told them uh, then pharmacist was not willing to give a medicine because there are some regulations 
then i told them to nearby a person nearby doctor who is well known to us he helped us he gave us a prescription even that patient was not able to uh, control pain and bladder was still distended then i called the relatives to come and take me when i went there and then when we went to the we found out that he she was having a big bladder and uh, because of constipation she did pass motion for more than 6 days so we need to do a digital do a digital evacuation when we were doing digital evacuation itself started passing urine and then the, uh, the next day they called me and told that she was better with uh, um i the no nausea and uh, everything was okay so like this during because of this covid i'm giving you only the three examples every day we used to get a call for a help so this is sort of these are the issues we face we don't know how covid is going to leave us we don't know how many people are struggling at home with pain and all these physical symptoms people who have facilities they go to hospital and and, and they try to do the best to the patients right so this is a uh, i am very uh, happy to uh, say that uh, virginia handerson has given a definition of nursing in 1966 after that 1967 hospice movement have come there i found that it is interesting to know that i i couldn't find any difference in that definition and this definition there are two words the meaning is the same in palliative care also uh, is looking for a peaceful dignified death even in nursing also we look for a peaceful and dignified death okay this is these are the role of nurse which already ma'am had explained i would like to uh, give you uh, with this patient example how we managed okay so this is a patient our our uh, a beloved patient came to our hospital to the opd asking for an euthanasia she asked the doctor give me some injection i want to die because i am not able to breathe and having severe pain but after two months you were uh, surprised to hear this she asked for a biryani and mysore pak okay so we also provided but she, of course she was not able to Uh, take it because she was on palliative tracheostomy, but we put it in her tongue so that she could taste. Okay, after all, all the food is up to uh, the tongue only taste is there. After that, I think we don't know what is happening to the food. Okay, so what we did, we gave anatomy to autonomy to the patient to decide about our care. What do we we gave? Uh, like uh, advanced directiveness we gave her an option what to be done then we gave her an autonomy to decide about her care and then she was willing to get admitted she was with us and all her physical symptoms we took care because she was not able to breathe and we did a palliative uh, tracheostomy and she was on a fixed uh, degenostomy and uh, we could be able to manage all her physical symptoms and we are able to support the family her daughter was has uh, become a school dropper because of her sickness so we could support her so we gave her an assurance that uh, she will be taken her education will be taken care later on it was taken care and we were given a dignified we were you know, like we become we facilitated for her a dignified death and she died after 5 months of a relationship with us and we feel that we provided a quality care to her and we and when we went to the village also people before previously nobody used to turn to her house so when we visit the people used to be waiting for our uh, visit so that like that we reduced the social isolation also this was all the role of a palliative care nurse okay so the issues are uh, the emerging issues the misconception is the big issue people think that palliative care only for a terminally ill patients even doctors who have 45 50 years of experience worked in a uh, cancer centers also will never accept for a putting the patient in a palliative care they will take the patient from palliative care to the active care 
so they think that palliative care is only for a people who are terminally ill a doctors who have given up their hopes for their for any progress but it is not true palliative care starts at the time of diagnosis itself it continues till even after death yes we provide a bereavement care we visit the family we give them a psychological support we try to provide whatever we have told earlier okay so that's the, the misconception have to be cleared it is a big issue for a palliative care so for this we need to give an aware we need to provide an awareness program and other issues like difference in team work so you can see in this picture if team work this man already talked about team work if team cooperation is not there you think what happened to that uh, uh, track so same thing will happen so i have lot of experience lot of uh, uh things to share with you but uh, due to the time limit i'll share only important points information gap between professionals yes we had an experience like we had one patient with a carcinoma rectum okay for that patient we have done a palliative colostomy so this patient uh the nurse called us and told that the bag is empty for two days Okay, Saturday and Sunday. Sunday night, she called and told us that bag is empty. So we told the nurse, the doctor told the nurse to insert a suppository. The next day, when we went and visited the patient, patient was having a distended abdomen and vomiting. Then we inquired the sister whether whether she has kept a suppository. She said yes, sir, I kept a suppository in the rectum. But the doctor failed to inform the nurse. she is unframed and failed to inform the nurse the suppository should be kept in the stoma so this gap between professionals will uh, affect the patient only okay so the balancing hope and uncertainty is also a biggest issue now we know what is no no what is going to happen to the world because of this covid but even then we have a hope that we will come out by in uh, 2021 that is what we are hearing from icmr and all the leaders okay and lack of funding we know that normally itself we need lot of fund but palliative care needs lot of fund in terms of medicine in terms of uh, transport in terms of man, man manpower material everything we need so for that we need lot of funding and the lack of training which which already discussed managing the siblings of the patient is an also a issue because they won't understand why this child is suffering why we have kept a child like that so are they going to miss them so all those can they be those issues also are palliative care issues and lack of guidance we need to adequate training missed and delayed reference one of our my friend who studied with me up to uh 10th standard uh, called me and said that i am having a i have been diagnosed with the carcinoma liver you are working in cmc is it possible for me to get a liver transplantation he asked me i was so shocked to hear that he is having a carcinoma liver and more than that he is he was still thinking that i am working in cmc so i explained him that i am not in cmc i am in pondicherry then i told him what i can do for him he was very stubborn that he need to be updated and then i uh, i asked his the i him to give the phone to his wife i talked to his wife and as the later only i came to know he had already made a hospital shopping to chennai i am to everywhere he has tried then he has come to us but it was very late slowly slowly every day morning evening night i used to talk to him talk to his wife and what can be done so all these things i talked to him but within one week he was no more so so delay sometimes delayed referrals missing referrals also are biggest issues in palliative care and need for professional autonomy and improvement and uh, many nurses are in this uh, group i know how we face we know what to do 
in particular situation but sometimes we can't do it because of something happened right the slide is not uh, able to see so ah, okay Are you all okay hello hello Carry on. Carry on. Okay. 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 So uh, the other issues are like, uh, like we know that we we know what to do for a patient. Sometimes because of the uh, uh, we need a doctor's order, we can't do uh, many things to a patient. So we can write a book on it, like uh, need for a professional autonomy improvement. Okay, and do not resuscitate. Like now, uh, ICMR is given a. clear cut uh, guidelines for do not resuscitate and many of us don't know even i came to know yesterday only that do not resuscitate guideline is there in icmr so many of us don't know that we have to know it and uh, euthanasia euthanasia like we know what happened to our nurse aruna samad 42 uh, years in coma at the age of 66 she died because of a uh, pneumonia to so the people uh, some people cried for a euthanasia but uh, luckily our nurses protected protected her and uh, gave her a dignified death okay and the lack of knowledge and different culture dealing with specific religious practices and uh, i have an experience with one patient patient with a brain meds he, he had a uh carcinoma somewhere he came with us uh, uh, to us with the carcinoma uh, sorry next uh, in the brain and uh, he was in delirium and he was in need of a palliative sedation and when we were discussing with his wife and because we couldn't see the way he is struggling he used to have frequent seizure and he used to shout and the whole bed used to shake and uh, he used to make lot of noise and other patients even uh, the down floor up the upstairs everywhere noise used to be there and every patient used to get scared and we requested and said we talk to the relatives regarding the palliative sedation but we his wife being a nurse she was not willing for a palliative sedation because what she told us she told sir because we as a team uh, only this is just yes excuse me ma'am uh, yeah it's just a gentle reminder i'm sorry to interrupt uh, but this is just a gentle reminder that our timing is still 3:30 and then we will okay. uh, have a question and answer round 2 so uh, Hello. Don't mind. Uh, I Hello. Another five minutes more. Okay. 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 Five minutes. Okay. So okay. this uh, yes. patient uh, said that uh, the relative said that uh, no, in our religion, when the last breath goes, the patient has to be awake. So we couldn't do. We saw in our own eyes the patient is struggling. We couldn't do much. How we can do only. Okay, so this is the uh, language and communication issues. This is the letter written by my patient. First, I showed you the picture. So our communication used to be always in papers. So if you know the language, it is not a problem. But if you don't know the language, it used to be a yeah problem. So other uh, palliative care issues like less GDP to overall health care. We know that now in Corona, how we are all facing the problem because of the Less GDP to the overall health care yes, and think no. of the palliative care. Government, government palliative care policies are there, but largely it is unimplemented. Now policy evaluation researches are not there, and public demand for palliative care is very low, and uh, service delivery capacity is also very poor. And decision making regarding patient care. About withholding and withdrawing life-sustaining care, the ICMR ICMR has given a guidelines for withholding and withdrawing life-sustaining care. We don't know how many of us have read it. 
and uh, pub palliative care in public health care is very good in Kerala, but we don't know about other states of India. And insurance for palliative care, as far as I know, it is there only for palliative chemotherapy. And share decision making is also a biggest issue. And availability of opioid. Even if opioid is available, people have fear of usage. And lack of advanced care planning, and anticipated prescribing medicines. Like when I was uh, when I was going for a training uh, in Kalyam, India, I have experienced in my own eyes. I have witnessed that how they have given a anticipated prescribing medicines. So they will give morphine and also uh, delcolex and for uh, antiemetics and all those things. They anticipate the uh, complications. They prescribe the medicines. Availability of volunteers is also a biggest issue, but it is very good in Kerala. And palliative care awareness is very good in Kerala. We need to achieve this in other parts of the state. Okay, so out of hours calls, palliative care nurses, doctors will get an out of hours call. There may be issues and uh, late disease presentation, which we can't uh, do not, uh, much about that. And ignorance about palliative care, family psychological support. So these were the these are the issues. Okay, lack of understanding roles of palliative care by family, unrealistic expectation of treatment and outcome, unconducive environment low nurse patient ratio this every nurse knows what is the uh, every hospital uh, the status of nurse patient ratio and managing pain and uh, other symptoms also were an issue and uh, emotional burden of providing palliative care after all we are also a human being we also feel sad we also feel ill we also have a problem in coping also we go into depression, personal discomfort with the death, dignity and bereavement because of our ambiguity roles. So for that, most of the problem can be solved by planned teamwork. You can see this, what is happening in this picture. If both, two go, both of them are fighting, nothing can be achieved. If everybody is cooperative, the goal can be achieved. And we need to have a positive attitude to achieve our goal. If you touch one life, you can touch uh, thousands of lives. So conclusion, palliative care is about quality of life of patients with life limiting disease and his family. Palliative care relief gives relief from pain, stress and symptoms. Even if no cure in palliative care, always a care. Palliative, in palliative care, patient and family has control over choices and in palliative care, there is no nothing, but there is always something. Palliative care add life to their days, not just days to their life. Providing palliative care is in everyone's business, not only government, not only NGO, not only Palin India, not only doctors, nurses, volunteers, patients, patient relatives. It is everyone's business. Here once I saw 100 and, uh, 330, I think, uh, participants. Okay, now I want you all to take a responsibility in taking care of palliative care. Okay, the, these two heroes are my guides. They, they are the role model for my uh, palliative care. Okay, working in palliative care is a humbling experience. I get in a great sense of satisfaction in giving people hope for a greater quality of life in the days, time they have left. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Latha Srikant, for the wonderful, wonderful topic that you have shared with us. Yes, ma'am. You have uh, 
highly set on the team member that those who needs palliative care, meaning of palliative, role of a palliative nurse, and you have uh, shared lots of uh, other informative uh, topics. Thank you so much. Uh, there's a saying that people are like tea bags. Once you, uh, you don't know the strength, you don't know how strong they are until you put them in a hot water. Lucky to have, yes. them. we are lucky to yes. have both Dr. Shantana Das and Dr. Lathasri Kant who have both, who both are very strong palliative care providers along uh, with us here in our MIST. Uh, we are happy to hear what are the care that you have provided to the patient? What are the uh, supports that you have been giving in the hospital settings and in the whole place? Thank you so much uh, to both the eminent speakers. I think everyone has uh, already got their work, time worth from the important points that uh, you have shared with us. Uh, once again, on behalf of everyone here, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Shantana Das and Dr. Latha Srikant for enlightening us with the palliative issues. Before I uh, close the session, there are some few questions that have arised. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Latha, ma'am, uh, yes. question, one question has uh, appeared from the chat box. Role of physio physiotherapist in palliative care patient uh, yes. in reducing pain. Um, yes, yes. You, uh, yeah, yeah. That? Yes, I even I have answered uh, during my talk itself before uh, the previously where we were having a palliative care team. In that team, we used to have a physiotherapist. So whenever we go for a uh, like uh, rounds, we used to take the palliative care uh, that uh, uh, team also. Sorry, uh, physiotherapist also with our. Uh, we all used to go together for a rounds. And we all used to discuss what can be done in uh, their view. Like we are not only taking care of cancer patients and other neurological disease patients, we are also taking care of patients with the quadriplegia, paraplegia. So definitely their role is very, very, very important. So they, are, they have a major role. Yes. I think okay. I have answered. The next question, thank you. Thank yes, you. ma'am, you have. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, next question is for uh, Shantana, ma'am. Are you there, ma'am? Dr. Shantana, ma'am? Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, ma'am, we can hear you. Uh, Are you on? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Shantana, ma'am. Okay. Uh, there is a question. How many palliative care organizations are available in Assam and in Gohati? And there is one more question. Patient hmm. migration from Assam to other parts of the country for better treatment. Why the mistrust in our health, in our medical system is growing among our patients in Assam? Can you please answer that question? Yeah. See, in Guwahati, uh, we have one of the oldest um, palliative care society, which is run by, can you hear me? I'm audible, right? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yes, yes. which is run by Dr. Dinesh Goswami. He's the pioneer of palliative care, not only in Assam, but entire Northeast India. So he runs a Guwahati uh, palliative pain and palliative care society, which is one of the first. And uh, after that, we have BBCI, B. Borwa Cancer Institute. They have a palliative care setup, uh, which is uh, run by Dr. Kabindra Bhagavati. He's also a medical officer in pain and palliative care, one of the oldest again. Then comes our institute, State Cancer Institute, GMCH. Uh, we are quite new, but uh, we have achieved a lot in this uh, last few years. So we are one of the institutes providing medical pain and palliative care. Um, Jorhat Medical College, uh, that is another new one, but they have a palliative care setup, which is um, also backed up by Patishruti Cancer Care Foundation. It's an NGO. So Patishruti is looking after the Department of Pain and Palliative Care in uh, Assam Medical College. Assam Medical College in Jorhat. Uh, it is in collaboration with Jorhat Medical College and Assam Cancer Care Foundation, the ECCF, which is uh, the branch of Tata, branch of Tata in Assam. Uh, these are the few cancer uh, palliative care providers, few renowned ones, and there are uh, a lot of hospices, but in Guwahati, we have just two 
first place. One is uh, Dipshika Cancer Care Foundation, which is quite old. Then comes uh, Sacred Heart Palliative Care, which is another one. And uh, there's another uh, very recently of uh, uh, hospice which came up, I think three to four years back for pediatrics. For pediatrics, it is called Shishu. It's again run by Dipshika Foundation, which is there in uh, Bombay also. Um, okay. uh, Shishu, uh, Shishu something in uh, that's in Guwahati itself. They look after only pediatrics cases, uh, like children below 12 years. So these are a few of the hospices and palliative care setups. And next, yes, you again, I think you gave me another question, which is a lot of uh, migration for, um, you know, a lot of, I would say, tourism, healthcare tourism, which is happening. A lot of people are leaving Assam and they prefer doing the treatment outside. They want to take a second opinion, maybe. Uh, even after telling them that uh, this palliative, when a patient reaches the palliative stage, it's, it's actually of no use traveling. So when they understand the concept of palliative, a lot of patients stay back. They prefer staying back. But yes, there are issues with a few um, uh, treatments here so people like to go outside and we have very limited hospitals also uh, only BBCI Northeast Cancer Care Hospital which is private and then our state government it's a government hospital so we have a lot of burden a lot of patients sometimes people patient wants to get you know uh, their treatment as early as possible so they prefer going out Hello. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Dorothy. Uh, yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. I have yeah answered my questions. Yes. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, there are so many other questions. I'm sorry, participants, that I cannot give uh, more time to the question and answer round because we have just one minute left of this. So I'm like to thank the speakers. I hope that in future we will collaborate and then have many more interactive sessions and I hope the participants will continue to join with us in future. Uh, I'd like to thank the Vice Chancellor, Dr. S.P. Singh, sir, and the entire team for supporting us to make the webinar a successful one.